Amelia told me the other day, she said, I'm going to get David $500. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, church scene. I don't, there it goes. Now I can say it again. Good evening, church family. It's so good to be here and so good to see everyone out and just so thankful to uh, be blessed to have this opportunity to uh, stand before the greatest people I know, and that's the Lafayette Church of Christ. And so we want to have a word of prayer before we get into our study this uh, evening. And I'm going to ask Brother Frank, if you would, to come and lead us in a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can meet today and at the end of the day and study your word. Thank you for, for the gift of your son who, who gave his life that we might have hope of heaven. Thank you for all the spiritual blessings that are in Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for the material blessings we have for our health, that we will have the opportunity to serve you, to worship you, and, and as we have opportunity to share your word with, with our fellow men. Help us to seek out opportunity to do this. To you, help us to use this program of evangelism and, and teach your words to the, the lost. Help us always seek to save the lost. And Father, bless those that are hurting. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless, bless David and his, his health, that you will bless him, that things may go well with him. Help him and bless him and bless the medical means that are being used. Bless others that are hurting that we, we know of and pray that you will bless them. Bless our leaders of our country. They may seek your, seek your help in, in making decisions about their uh, obligation as a, as a government. Bless them, forgive us, bless us through the evening and the night. Christ's name meant. I appreciate that prayer so, so very much. Um, as you know, we are studying the Holy Spirit. In tonight's lesson, if you remember last week, uh, we concluded our study on the work of the Holy Spirit. And there's one more, uh, what I would like to call a foundational message uh, regarding the Holy Spirit. And then we will move into other discussions concerning the Spirit. And the next one that I want us to think about is the influence of the Holy Spirit as you and I see it in the Bible. Now, there are two ways that I want us to examine this. And that is by looking at his influence in the past, 
and then taking a look at his influence in the present. And the way that I'm going to do this, or the way that I decided to do this, is by making a comparison. What we're going to do is we're going to look at aspects of the Holy Spirit and his influence in the past, and then we will compare to his present influence today. Now, we may not make it through this lesson tonight because there are many verses that I want us to look at. But if we do not cover it tonight, then Lord willing, we will cover it two weeks from tonight. Lord willing, and I am able, I will be in the gospel meeting next Wednesday night at the Berea Church of Christ. And then the following Wednesday, I have a trip planned to Augusta, Georgia, uh, to the ALS clinic there. And I'm not certain what time I will be getting home that day. And so, Lord willing, the first Wednesday night in May. And that's really hard to think about, isn't it? I mean, May of 2023 is almost here. But we will pick up if we do not finish the line. There are three different comparisons that I want us to make in looking at the influence of the Holy Spirit. To begin with, as you and I think about his influence in the past, I want us to think about the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding, and the skill of the Holy Spirit because you can see that all throughout both the Old Testament and in the New Testament in the past. Notice, if you will, first of all, in Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 through 5, and I am going to call on some of the good men of the congregation to read several of these verses for me tonight, if you would be willing. And so uh, I'm just going to leave it up to you. And you feel like reading, then just bell her out and take off. son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold, silver, bronze, and cutting jewels from the city, and carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. Now, there you see it plainly in the Bible that God said, in regard to this man by the name of Beelzebub, that he was going to be filled <clears throat> with the Holy Spirit and notice the areas where in the uh, Holy Spirit would influence him. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and even workmanship. So you can see that the skill that these men used in preparing the tabernacle, it was given to them by none other than the Holy Spirit. You'll also see this in Numbers chapter 11, beginning in verse uh, 16. Someone read that passage, if you will. So the Lord said to Moses, 
Give it to me, 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know will be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will talk of the spirit that is upon you and will put the same upon them and they shall bear the burdens of the people with you that you may not bear yourself alone. Now, you need to understand the backdrop of what the Lord is saying to Moses in this passage before these two verses Moses is complaining to God that the burden of judging the people and making decisions for the people is too much for him so look at what the Lord says he's going to do he is going to take the spirit that was upon Moses, which was none other than the Holy Spirit, and he was going to put it upon these men so they would have the ability of Moses to be able to judge and discern among these people. Then there is Judges chapter 3, verses 9 to 11. Someone read that passage if you would. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged him. He went out to war, and the Lord delivered him. Hushan, Rishabane, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Hushan, Rishabane. So the land had rest for 40 years. Then Abdiel, son of Kenaz, died. I'm glad that Jesse had to say Hushan, Rishabane. You know, I have always wondered why people who named their children after Bible characters, they've never used this name before. Uh, but notice, if you will, that Othniel was decided by God to judge the people of Israel. And notice how he judged them. It was through the power of the Holy Spirit that he was able to judge these people. And so you can see in the Old Testament that God gave them the ability to have wisdom and knowledge and understanding and also skill. But likewise, when we come to the New Testament, we also see that the Spirit of God gave certain people in that era of time the ability to have wisdom and knowledge and understanding and discernment. Someone read this passage if you would. It's just given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, for the one is given through the Spirit, the other is wisdom, and to another the other is knowledge, If you will, that the Spirit gave wisdom to some, He gave knowledge to some, and He gave discernment to some. And so, when you and I look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, God gave a wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and skill to those people. But what about the present day? Does God influence us with his wisdom, knowledge, understanding, 
and also heal. Well, let's see what the Bible has to say. When you think about it, the Bible encourages us to get wisdom, to get understanding, and if you'll notice, in that passage of Scripture, Proverbs 4, verses 5 through 7, that twice God says to get wisdom and understanding. And the Bible also says that understanding is the principle, or in other words, the chief most important thing in this life. Now, why would God encourage us to have something if he did not want us to have it? The very fact of the matter is that the Bible tells us that wisdom is something that the Holy Spirit influences us to have. But how is it that you and I get wisdom today? Under the Old Testament and under the New Testament, if you remember, their wisdom and understanding, it came through a miraculous power. Now, we do not miraculously have wisdom today. Now, we can get wisdom, we can get understanding, but what does the Bible teach us? How is it that you and I acquire the wisdom and understanding of God? Look at what James said in James chapter 1 and verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And what's going to happen is going to be given to him. So, wisdom is something that you and I must pray for, knowing that the source of wisdom is none other than God. Just like Solomon would say in Proverbs 2 and verse 6, For the Lord gives what? He gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Now, don't miss what Solomon said. Where does wisdom come from? It comes from the Lord. Now, where do we find it? It comes from his mouth. Now, with that thought in mind, think with me about John 17 and verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is what? It's truth. Now, where do we find the words of God? in no other place than the Bible. And so when you and I think about how the Holy Spirit influences us with wisdom and knowledge and understanding, how is it that he influences us today? Well, it is certainly through the Bible because what would you know? Name one thing you would know about the wisdom, knowledge, or understanding of God apart from the Bible. You would not. And so the Bible is the way that the Holy Spirit influences us when it comes to wisdom. Again, not only must we pray for wisdom, but think about what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. He was told or commanded, if you will, study to show thyself approved unto who? 
under God. If you and I want the wisdom of God, the same wisdom that we saw under the Old Testament and under the New Testament, then what must we do? We pray and we ask God for his wisdom and then we go to the one source where we learn about the wisdom of God and that is none other than in the Bible. But what about skill or ability? I want you to think about the story of the talents in the book of Matthew chapter 25 uh, verses 14 and 15. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why is it that this master gave five talents to one man and two to another and then one to another? Well, aren't you glad that the Bible gives us the answer? According to this passage, why is it that the master dispersed the talent in that way? The Bible says that he gave to each according to his own ability. In other words, what he did is he looked at the person and he recognized their abilities. He recognized their talents. And that's the way that he dispersed those gifts in that time. Now, when you look at this passage, there is absolutely nothing miraculous about it. The man who had five talents, he used them appropriately. And what happened? He made five more. Was that a miracle? No, it's the same for you and I today. If we have abilities, in every ability that we have, where does it come from? It comes from God. You know, you can take a man and you can send him to preaching school and he can study the Bible and get all kinds of degrees, but you know as well as I know, he can't preach a lick because it just doesn't seem that that's what he was called to do. Now, I'm not saying that we are called in a miraculous way, but I am saying that there are certain people who just have a way of getting the message across before they get any instruction or teaching or schooling. Where did that talent come from? Where did that gift come from? It came from none other than God. And when we use our talents and our abilities, then what is the Bible teaching us? That they are going to multiply. In other words, we will gain more abilities in this life that we live. Now, in the second place, I want us to consider the idea of guidance. When you and I look to the Bible, we understand that the people of the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that they had guidance from the Holy Spirit. For example, 
In 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 2, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. I love that verse. It doesn't get more inspired than that, does it? David is saying that when he spoke, whose word was he speaking? He was speaking none other than the Spirit's word. In the book of Second Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, Someone read that passage, if you will. What is that verse telling us? Every Old Testament prophet and New Testament prophet, how is it that those individuals spoke. They spoke because they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. In the book of Second uh, Timothy chapter 3, in verse 16, the Bible says, All Scripture is by the inspiration of God. In other words, all scripture is from the breath of God. But when I read that verse, I need to ask myself the question, what does the phrase all scripture refer to? At that time, it referred to to every scripture that existed right then. Now, when Paul wrote this, it was sometime around maybe 65 to maybe 67 AD. And that lets me know that there were still books of the New Testament that had not been written. And so what Paul included in all scripture is every Old Testament book and every New Testament book that had been written up unto that point. It was by the inspiration of God and then you've got the New Testament writers. For example, someone read First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Sorry, I had to put some lipstick on. Don't worry, it's man's lipstick. So. But in this passage, what is Paul teaching us? Paul is saying that when they spoke, who, who was it that gave them the power to speak? Was it none other than the Holy Spirit? Then again, in the book of John 16, in verse 13, notice what Jesus said in this verse. Someone read that passage. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Now, what kind of guidance are we talking about in these verses thus far? This is guidance in the miraculous sense. These men would know just exactly what God wanted them to say. In fact, 
I think Mark 13 and verse 11 says it better than anyone. Someone read that passage. Now, anyone who has stood in this position, can you just step up here and not take thought for what you're going to say? I mean, you ask any of the men who have spoken here, Brother Jesse, Brother Ken, Brother Frank, Brother Dawson, <clears throat> But <clears throat> I'll get it in a minute. Uh, Brother J or Brother Don, anyone, you have to put time, I mean considerable time, in study in what you are going to say. But in this instance, did they have to worry what they were going to say? No, why? Because the Holy Spirit was going to tell them exactly what to say. Now, in each one of these that we have looked at, those people under the Old Testament and under the New Testament, they received guidance from the Holy Spirit. Spirit. But remember that it was in a miraculous sense. Now, what about us today? Do we receive guidance from the Holy Spirit? Well, don't take my word for it. Let's read what the Bible says. In Romans 8 and verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now, tell me what that verse is saying. If you are a son of God or a child of God, and raise your hand if you are a child of God. Now, according to this verse, if you are a child of God, what is happening in your life every day? What's happening? You're being led by the Spirit, okay? And that's not the only verse that teaches us that. For example, in Galatians 5 and verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Another verse that teaches us that we are led by the Spirit. But look at what Paul says next. You are not under law. Now wait a minute. Is Paul saying that there is no law for you and I as Christians. No, he is not. I have to understand the entirety of the book of Galatians when I read this verse. The book of Galatians was written to a group of people who had been converted to Christianity, but what they were wanting to do is go back and live their lives by the old law. And Paul said, you cannot do that. And so the law that Paul had in mind right here is the old law or the Old Testament. For example, notice what Paul would say, in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, someone read that verse, if you will. Romans 8 and verse 1. 
there is now, therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, notice what Paul said. The law of what? The law of the Spirit. That's the law that you and I live by today. That is the law that you and I are led by today. And what is it that we learn and read about the law of the Spirit? Only in this book. This is the only place where you and I can learn what the Spirit has to say to you and to me. And so what we have to do is we have to walk after the Spirit. And notice what Paul said here in Romans 8, verses 5 and 6. We must set our minds on what? On the things of the Spirit. A lot like the fruit of the Spirit that we see in Galatians 5, verses 21 through 25. Now, where is it, that, or how is it, that you and I can set our minds on the law of the Spirit? Only by setting our minds on the things that are found in this book. Let me ask you this question, and I want you to think about it for a minute. Are you and I led by the Spirit? Yes, we are, because the Bible says so. Is a message that an individual gets up and preaches. Is it the Spirit leading us? Yes, because folks, none of the things that I have said to you are my own words, but they are straight out of the Bible. And so when you and I are living our lives by the teaching of God's Word, are we being led by the Spirit? Yes, we are. Not in a miraculous way, but the Bible does teach us that we are led by the Spirit. In the third place, I want you to consider spiritual gifts of the past. Now, you and I know that when it comes to spiritual gifts, and this passage was too long to put on the PowerPoint, but if you and I take the time to go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and if you would, please go there. When you and I go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and beginning in verse 1, notice what Paul says. Now, concerning what? What is Paul's subject of discussion in this chapter? He tells us right there in that verse. In fact, the entire chapter is all about spiritual gifts. In beginning, about with verse 4, if you will notice, there are all sorts of different spiritual gifts that were given to the people back then. But here's some, something that you and I need to consider. And that is the fact of why is it that Paul is talking to them 
about spiritual gifts. As the chapter concludes, you will see that Paul is pointing out the fact that these brethren were fussing over these spiritual gifts. Some wanted to be apostles, others wanted to work miracles, others wanted knowledge, and because they didn't have a certain gift, they were upset. But look at how Paul ends this chapter in verse 31. He encouraged them to covet or to desire what principle? Love. Now, what is chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians all about? It's all about love. Why does he encourage them to covet or chase after love? If you will look at verse 8, what does he say about love? It never fails. But what is going to fail? Prophecies and miracles and all sorts of miraculous works. Those things were going to pass away. And then he ends in verse 13 by saying, And now by his faith, hope, and love, but the greatest is what? It's love. And so when you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, they have what we would call spiritual gifts, but they were all miraculous gifts. And so the question that I have to ask myself is, are there spiritual gifts that you and I have today? Now, in order to get my answer, you're going to have to Come back two weeks from now, like Paul Harvey said, and you will hear the rest of the story. I think that is a good stopping point for us. And because the next point that I want to cover is just a little bit lengthy, I want to show you something that you already know we all have gifts and we know that they came from only one person and that is none other than God. And I want us to see those gifts that God has given us. You have been a great class as you always are and I appreciate so very much your kind attention.
very, very thankful for your presence. Before we go into our prayer list, I would like to remind everyone to to keep your uh, your contact cards, the people that you have on your list that are not Christians that need to be or that are erring Christians that need to come back. Make sure you keep that card in your mind and in your heart and mostly in your prayers. We need to pray for those people every day. And if you have anyone on that list that we need to send compassion cards out to, that you think they're ready to go take that next step and for us to engage them uh, with our efforts in evangelism, I hope that you will get those cards written on our little uh, contact cards. They're on that uh, bookcase to the left if you're leaving the auditorium. Get that information on here. And we will get them into our system. And we will do our best as a church together to bring those folks to Christ. And we really need to work on that. That is so important. There's not anything more important that we can do than to help people get to heaven. We have other folks on our prayer list. I want to make sure that we, we keep all these good folks in our prayers. Uh, keep, keep David in your prayers. He mentioned tonight here in a couple of weeks he's going to another uh, trip down to Augustus. We hope that goes well and we'll keep that in our prayers. Uh, Angela McCauley is still under hospice care. We want to remember her in our prayers as well. Continue to keep Joyce and Lloyd in your prayers. Also, Albert Russell is going for tests on Friday, April 14th, so keep Albert in your prayers as he goes and have those tests run. Uh, Diane Deering is going to have a procedure on April 27th, so keep that in your prayers as well. Also, Joan Wade is still under hospice care, so continue to keep her in your prayers. She did extend a big thank you for all the cards and prayers that she has received. So thanks for sending those cards and, and even more so for the prayers on her behalf. I have a few additions to the prayer list tonight that were not in the bulletin. Uh, we want to remember these. Uh, Abby Fitzgerald, she had to be taken to the hospital. She's in the ER now to have a CT scan done. She's having some abdominal pain, and we certainly want to remember her in our prayers. Also, uh, Cole Clifton, this is Ann Clifton's nephew, is going to have heart surgery tomorrow. So remember Cole Clifton in your prayers. We also want to remember Ginger Maxwell. She is in the hospital and she's having lots of health issues now. So please remember Ginger in your prayers. Don't forget we have the basket in the foyer uh, for diapers and wipes for Dusty and Lana. Uh, for their baby girl, so make sure that you fill that basket up for them. Teen singing for this month is going to be on April 16th, and that will be in Ultawa. Don't forget, card group two, that's the two outside aisles. We'll be having our uh, compassion cards signing this Sunday, the 16th, following evening worship. So plan on being being afterward for that. I got I had four extra new cards to give to Tara this afternoon, so she'll get those all straightened up and uh, and ready for us. Um, and there was a, a request last time. We will have some of those cards available upstairs, so you don't have to go downstairs for that. So just let me know, and uh, we can give them to you in the pews, or we can set you up in the library, whatever's most convenient for you. Don't forget the Ladies' Day at Pleasant Grove. That will be on April 22nd. There's more information about that on the bulletin board. Also remember the wedding shower for Chloe. That is uh, April 23rd. That's Sunday at 2.30 here at the building. And they are registered at Amazon. Our fellowship meal for this month will be on April 30th. Following morning worship. And we'll have our afternoon worship at 2 p.m. Like we normally do during our meal uh, Sunday. Thinking ahead to May. Men's breakfast on May 6th. So you can go ahead and get that on your calendar. One of the few things I don't have to remind myself of too much because I just really want to do it. Family youth activity sign-up sheet is also still on the bulletin board, so please keep that as well. With all the announcements I have at this time, at the proper time, our closing prayer will be led by Don Shields, and we will turn our songs over to Jackson. Invitation song will be number 655. Song before encouragement will be number 694. Verses 1 through 5 of 694. To Canaan's land, my Lord, my way.
Good evening. I want to speak to you tonight about uh, the tale of two serpents. And that's not T-A-I-L, it's T-A-L-E. The tale of two serpents. And I'm sure everyone here uh, is familiar with these serpents. If not, we're still going to cover them. And or if you are, we're still going to cover them. If you're not, well, you know, listen up. Uh, these stories signify something, and they signify some things that, that would later come. So some of these things you'll, you'll see in, in the way of types and anti-types, uh, maybe in the likeness of some other things that we will cover. They show likenesses, figures, shadows of, of things that were to come and that those things that we will see. By the end of Genesis chapter 2, creation is complete. God has placed man in the garden and given him some commandments to follow. Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 and following. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows in that day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, number one, that it was pleasant to the eye, number two, and the tree desirable to make one wise, number three, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. And then, the, and then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam said that, uh, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said to him, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you that you you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The serpent deceived her. 1 John 2, verses 15 and following, corresponds with the very things that Eve did. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, one, lust of the flesh, two, lust of the eye, three, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. All sin falls into these categories and is in the likeness of the very first sin ever committed. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 9 and 10. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, decept, unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive a love of the truth that they may be saved. Revelation 12 at verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. First Peter 5 at verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That old serpent, Satan, devours us through deceit, the deceitfulness of sin. James 1 verses 12 beginning. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, and the Lord has promised to those that love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But here it is. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. That's what happened to Eve. Then when desire is has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Romans 5 at verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. Romans 6 at verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. In view of types and antitypes, Romans 5.14 gives us something to consider. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Here it is. Who is the figure of him that was to come? For if by one man's offense death reigned, by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Adam was a figure and a type. Jesus Christ, the antitype. Now have looked at the first serpent, now the tale of the second serpent. Beginning in Numbers, Chapter 21 at verse 4. This the Israelites have come out of Egypt and they are in the wilderness. And beginning at verse 4 of chapter 21, then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and, and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our souls loathe this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery servants among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away these serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. 
The Israelites sinned by speaking against the Lord and Moses. The Lord gave instructions. The people were to follow the instructions if they were not to die. When they were bitten, they had to look at the bronze serpent upon the pole. They not look, they die. If they looked, they lived. God gave them a remedy. And he only gave them one remedy, and they were to follow that remedy. Moses fashioned this bronze serpent, put it on the pole, and lifted it up so the people could look at it. A bitten Israelite could believe in the Lord. They could believe in the remedy. But until they followed the instructions and looked at the serpent on the pole, they could not be healed of the venom of the fiery serpent. Those that believed in the remedy and followed the instructions lived. Those that didn't, did not. They had to look upon the lifted up serpent. Now let's read Jesus' words in John 3, beginning at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This shows us clearly that the bronze serpent was a type, and Jesus Christ, the antitype. Hebrews 12, beginning at verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And here it goes. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There again you see the type and the anti-type. Looking unto Jesus today. And those Israelites had to look upon the bronze serpent. Just as the Israelites had to look, we are also today to look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. The words of Jesus spoken will judge us, according to John 12, 48. And there is only one Lord, according to Ephesians 4, 5. There is only one remedy for sin today. Many things are spoken of about the forgiveness of sins. John 3, 5 tells us we must be born of water and the Spirit. Faith belief is required, but it's not belief or faith alone. Faith only. There is something God has given us to do. He's given us instructions, commands to follow. Just as those Israelites had to follow instructions if they wanted to live, when they were bitten by the fiery serpent, so we also must follow God's instructions. Hebrews 5 at verse 9. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Not belief only, obedience is required. The author of sin and death was Satan, that old serpent. The author of forgiveness of sins, of eternal life, is Jesus Christ. So there you have the tale of two serpents. We can see the types and the anti-types and the way that they apply. It is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, according to 2 Peter 3 at verse 9. The question is, will you choose to look unto Jesus that the deadly venom of sin can be removed from your lungs? The cure for the Israelites, it was not a magical bronze servant on a pole. It was obeying God's command to look upon the serpent. Today, forgiveness of sin is not a magical formula. It's no repetitive prayer. It's no Holy Spirit experience. It's not asking Jesus Christ into your heart to be Lord of your life. Today, if someone is truly seeking forgiveness, they must follow God's commands to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, to repent of their sins, turn from the things that are unrighteous, 
confess Jesus Christ before men and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Will you choose Jesus Christ? If you do, that would be our prayer and we would be glad to help you in any way that we could. But understand one thing. By not choosing Jesus, you will have chosen that old serpent. If there's anyone here who has not obeyed the gospel, tonight is a terrific opportunity for you to do so. We'll be glad to help you with that in any way that we can. And if anyone has anything in their life that needs prayers of the church, any issues that you need prayers, won't you also come as together we stand and sing. We have been so marvelously led today and this evening in lessons from Brother David and the Holy Spirit and Brother Ken. Thank you so very much, Ken, and the two serpents. We can take those stories and the types and any types and be thankful that Jesus Christ is on our side and we have got it made. The victory is already ours. We want to thank everybody who's out tonight. We appreciate you being here. We have a good number and thank you so very much. We're glad that you decided to be here. Let's I'll be encouraged to come back Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Bring somebody with you and uh, so we can fill this building up once again. Any other announcement needs to be made before we have our closing prayer? God bless you all. Let's, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to come together as your body to study another portion of your will. So thankful for David's ability to teach us in such a wonderful way about the Holy Spirit. So thankful for Brother Ken for sharing us this wonderful, encouraging lesson straight from the Bible and these verses that he's read. So thankful for this. Father, we're mindful of those who are not with us tonight because of sickness. We pray that you'll help each and every one. Please especially help Ginger Maxwell in the hospital. Help Cole tomorrow in his heart surgery. And please help Angela McCauley during his time up at East Ridge. Please help Adele and Lloyd and Sister Abby. Uh, we pray that things will be well with her. Father, continue to help David Payton in every way and be with uh, Kelly and his family. Be with them on their travels and help them uh, in, 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 as you see fit. Father, continue to help all of us and bless us. Forgive us of our sins as we depart. In Christ's name, amen.